To discuss this and much more, let's bring in my first guest. Joining me now is Michael Duran, Senior Fellow and Director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East at the Hudson Institute. Michael, thanks so much for coming back this week. Let's talk, first of all, about the trip that Joe Biden just made to Israel. What do you think he has achieved, if anything? Well, uh, thanks for having me, James. Great to be here. I think that uh, he achieved a number of things. If we look at it from a political point of view, I think it was a, a success uh, for him, uh, uh, particularly um, uh, among pro-Israel uh, voters. The uh, feeling among the pro-Israel community in Washington is that uh, this is one of the um, most stellar moments in the history of U.S.-Israeli uh, relations. The Brett Stevens, uh, conservative, uh, uh, anti-Trump conservative, a columnist in the New York Times called it uh, Biden's finest hour and, um, and, and presented it as one of the most uh, pro-Israel um, um, pro, pro, pro moves in the history of U.S.-Israeli relations. Uh, the Israelis also were greatly heartened by it. There were, uh, uh, there were people who were deeply moved by uh, the words that Biden spoke there. So I think all in all, a success. But under the surface, there's something else going on, which some of the Israelis have started to notice as well. Uh, and they're calling it a, a bear hug. Uh, you know, this is a, he's gripping them very tight and to, uh, saying it, that it's all about love. But the Israelis are feeling um, significantly constrained uh, because he, he Biden doesn't want them uh, to uh, upset his Iran policy, doesn't want them to um, the war to expand into uh, uh, into Lebanon, um, doesn't want them to go too far in Gaza, uh, and so he's got them kind of on a a, a tight leash. And Biden has spoken, uh, he's given a bit of an address here, and he's spoken about funding for both Israel and Ukraine. Now, of course, Ukraine has is probably less popular among the Republican Congress uh, than Israel. Let's have a listen to what he's had to say. Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. They both want to completely annihilate a neighboring democracy, completely annihilate it. That's why tomorrow I'm going to send to Congress an urgent budget request to fund America's national security needs, to support our critical partners, including Israel and Ukraine, is a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations. Help us keep American troops out of harm's way. Help us build a world that is safer, more peaceful, more prosperous for our children and grandchildren. Michael, what do you make of the strategy of almost linking Israeli funding uh, to Ukraine funding to get Republicans over the line. Is this politically a wise move here? Uh, I think it probably is from a, from a political point of view, because he's got uh, er eroding support for Ukraine among Republicans. But Israel uh, is, a, is, a, is a cause that um, Republicans feel very strongly about. So he's challenging them to vote down support for Israel um, uh, those who are skeptical about the support for Ukraine to vote down support for Israel. Uh, my guess is that that will probably work for him. And, Michael, I want to ask about this bear hug mentality. I've been seeing it. I haven't heard it called that, but I've sensed very much uh, this, this idea here. And I also want to ask you about this aid that he's negotiated for Hamas, but I haven't seen anything about conditions around um, releasing those hostages, including quite a number of American citizens. Has the U.S. projected inadvertently even weakness here? And does it tie into his broader sort of agenda around not uh, upsetting the apple cart too much with Iran? Well, I, I think it probably has uh, undermined the Israelis uh, somewhat here because they uh, uh, the Israelis were uh, uh, put uh, Gaza un under a siege. And their their point was, we're not going to lift the siege until we get our hostages back. And uh, the, well, the siege is being lifted. Um, I don't I don't want to judge it too harshly uh, because uh, I don't know all of the diplomacy that's going on around this. Uh, there, there's no doubt that America's um, Arab allies are putting a lot of pressure on uh, on Biden. To, to ensure that the, that the civilian population of Gaza isn't harmed uh, too much by Israeli actions. Now, we all know 
Hamas uses civilians as human shields. It carries out military operations from civilian areas. From a uh, from an international legal point of view, everything that Israel is doing is justified, uh, no doubt about it. And, and for those of us um, who were horrified by the uh, by the uh, rape of uh, Israeli women, the murder of Israeli children, the burning ch Israeli children in front of their uh, their parents, and and uh, and so on. We, we just think, go take care of business, do whatever it takes to root this organization out. But we have to be aware, as we're saying this, that, that uh, Hamas is carrying out a YouTube war that is highly effective, in the, um, especially in the uh, Arab and Muslim world. But even beyond that, um, you, know, you can see the European left and the American left is, uh, is responding to all of these images that Hamas is presenting, true and untrue. And I mean, we saw this with the Al Ghali hospital in Gaza City, which was hit, or the parking lot next to it, seems to have been hit by part of or a missile launched by a Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And yet, it seemed to me like the media here had already pre-digested Hamas propaganda, you know, taking Hamas, a terrorist organization, at their word that, no, this was Israeli. Uh, this was an Israeli piece of ordinance that did this. Are you surprised at how many institutions in the West seem to, you know, be so sympathetic to the Hamas and Iranian vision of the Middle East? Does it d disturb you a bit? Well, it disturbs me greatly. I mean, the, this is a textbook case because the it, um, the the um, the ordinance did not fall on the hospital. It fell into the parking lot next to the hospital. And within minutes, within minutes, the rumor went all, not the rumor, the report spread by credible news organizations all around the world that 500 people had died. This is, the, the how did they know 500 people had died? I, I have no idea how many actually died from the, uh, from the, from the thing, but the number 500 is already out immediately. It, and, and the hospital destroyed, 500 people died. You have people, um, heads of state, heads of government, uh, tweeting their their uh, their anger, people in the streets, and they uh, uh, they believe it now. It's become a fact for a significant percentage of the um, um, of the world's population that is following this. It's a fact that the Israelis bombed the uh, bombed the hospital when that's not what happened at all. Uh, so, uh, am I surprised? Uh, uh, no, because I've been watching this since the 2006. I was in the White House in the 2006 Israeli um, Hezbollah war, and Hezbollah presented that as a war of Israel against Lebanese children very successfully. And uh, and it's it's they they've they've gotten better and better with social media at this tactic. But I am I am surprised at at um, at how little pushback there is to it in mainstream news organizations around the world. It is shocking, Michael. You know, you see they say they're killed by Israel or Israel claims when it's the other side. Michael Duran, I'd love to have you on sometime for a real deep dive about Iranian propaganda, but that's all the time we've got for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Take care.